You know, I was thinking about the pandemic as a, a precipitant of connection. It's kind of an odd uh, view, but in other words, the, you know, there was such isolation during the pandemic. And part of uh, what we recognized was the pandemic, which was, in a, it was a natural artifact of a time, of an era, and really uh, catastrophic. It pointed to our lack of connection at one level and our hyper-connection on another. It pointed to the function, uh, negative function of isolation uh, within our own social context and the need for connection, relationality, the importance of it. Um, it through it going into this extreme situation where we're sliding off of, you know, curbs in order to avoid each other. And um, at the pre-conscious level, there is this kind of rising up. Yearning, of, a yearning, yearning for connection. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that was striking in the pandemic was all the ways people found to connect uh, because of that incredibly deep desire to not be alone. And in Italy, people stood on their balconies and sang together as a safe mm -hmm. way to sing together. I know people in the city of Berkeley who did something similar. Everybody just stood kind of in front of their house and made music together, socially distanced. And, but even before that, as the Surgeon General of the United States keeps pointing out, it's his main focus, we have a, another pandemic of loneliness Capitalism, Silicon Valley technology, a lot of other things have really pushed us apart. And there's a lot of other stuff in sociology looking at how, you know, 50 years ago, a lot of people belonged to unions, bowling leagues, churches, social groups, etc. that there were, you know, not very many people worked at home, not very many people lived alone, not many people were self-employed, that we lived in a much more communal way. And there's definitely been some freedom, but also at a cost. And 30% of adults I read recently in the United States live alone. And, um, you know, I'm one of them, and I have a lot of good connections in my life, but still it's not built in the way that it would have been yeah. in, you know, the lives of people living living in big extended households, being li living as you do here at Upaya in community. And so what's really interesting to me that I think has bearing on the climate crisis is there is a deep yearning for life to be different. People want to be more deeply connected, and some of that can come through climate solutions. In the UK, they're talking about 15-minute cities. We should live in a way where everything we need yes. um, is 15 minutes by foot or bike. And if you're doing your life by foot or bike, not by car or Amazon delivery, speaking of the nightmare, um, then you're seeing your neighbors, you know where you are in a very deep way, you're really connected to your place, you're making it safer by everybody being out on the street doing stuff, as Jane Jacobs talked about in The Death and Life of Great American Cities. So I think there's on the one hand a deep recognition that we were never separate, starting with our biology, the fact that you know the body that each of us occupies is actually a community of many species of bacteria and microorganism. I heard once 90% of the DNA in the human body is not human DNA because you know you could not digest your food. You you know we have so many my you know there are the bad ones but so many good microbes. And the idea of isolation of the rugged individual, you cannot live for more than a few minutes without inhaling this yeah. beautiful atmosphere created by plants so long ago and maintained by them. You cannot live or for more... Food. Or, or food. Or water. food, water, yes. <laughs> and again, and in a more conscious way, you cannot live without community. And you see, I think, a lot of the tragedy. I live in a city with a lot of homelessness people who fell out of the community that might take care of them when they're financially or... Um, otherwise desperate, you know, but a lot of affluent people are also deeply lonely. And so none of these things are separate. And Third Act, uh, whose advisory board I sit on, sees the climate crisis and the crisis of democracy as inseparable. We need, we can see the same people funded by the fossil fuel industry pushing against um, access to voting, voting equality, uh, democratic representation, um, representing the majority. And, um, you know, so just in so many different ways, I see that yearning, I see people reaching for it, I sometimes see people building it in great ways with intentional communities, new ways of connecting, 
etc. But I think it's one, it's not separate from the climate crisis, and the solution is not separate from the climate crisis. I'm a person who gets extremely excited about <laughs> renewables just in that we have the solutions and that we didn't 20 years ago and it's changed so fast. But I think on the one hand, we don't only need material, technical solutions. On the other hand, I think to really embrace those solutions, we need another kind of thinking where we make our decisions based on the benefit of the whole. And that's something in many indigenous worldviews is just so normal. You're making a dis you know, how you hunt, how you fish, how you harvest, how you manage the, and in, engage with the world around you is based on the well-being of the whole, not individualism. And you can see with overfishing in the ocean, with clear-cutting ancient forests, with the fossil fuel industry, etc. you know, the very antithesis of that. So I think in a sense to, even to make the practic most practical solutions work, we need these transformations of imagination. And the good news is that both of them are happening, but both of them need to be bigger, stronger, faster, and deeper. Deeper. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> bigger, see, stronger, faster sounds very top down, too. Yeah, but I yeah. see, in a sense, I utterly embrace what Christiana described the physical, and I feel often that we're in a, a race between the deterioration of the physical condition of the planet as described by scientists and witnessed by those of us living with fires and floods and extreme heat and bizarre weather, and sometimes in many parts of the world, famine, and uh, the growth of a climate movement, the transformation yeah. of consciousness, and the growth of alternatives um, for how we live, how we make our energy, how we get around etc. Because I also think that we have to imagine abundance differently. It's, not, it's been imagined as owning lots of stuff, using lots of stuff, going lots of places. At the same time that that's part of us being really poor in social connection and feeling connected and embraced by human and non-human right. communities. So I feel excited about the transformations underway but anxious that they're not going fast enough and deep enough to respond to what is also going very rapidly and feels like it's accelerated a lot with the underlying El Nino this year, which is the physical crisis. Yeah. So I, I think what we're saying, correct me please, <laughs> if I'm wrong, but I think what we're saying is that without wanting to minimize the very painful, destructive, negative consequences of climate change or of the pandemic, that we can think of both of them, climate being the constant challenge, as a gym for humanity, where we're being invited to strengthen many muscles that we have lost track of. The one that we're talking about right now is the muscle of interconnection, of solidarity, of relationships that in this race to benefit myself, to appropriate myself, to have this, that, um, in this terrible trajectory that we started thousands of years ago, of separating ourselves from nature, we have also separated ourselves from each other as well as from self. And so the challenge here, the invitation is, how do we bring this together? Because ultimately it is together. We have imagined in our little head, in our infinite wisdom, that these things are <laughs> separate, right? But they're not. And that is the invitation that is there for us. And so a question that I would love to hear both of you address is, if that is so, then it seems that the challenge ahead of us is to evolve what I would call the operating system of the collective consciousness, because the operating system that we're having is sorely deficient vis-a-vis -vis the challenges that we have. So we have to evolve that operating system at a collective level. And we only do that at a collective level if we start at the individual level. 
So I would love to hear both of you speak to the relationship between personal understanding, personal transformation, and systemic change. Mm. Because honestly, that jump is one that is not easy to verbalize. I think we all have it in our gut, but it is one that really needs to be unpacked because otherwise we're tickling the elephant with a little feather, right? And, 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 and no matter how many little feathers you bring, the elephant is just not going to move. So what is the relationship here between who we are, who we understand ourselves to be, how we turn up in the world, how do we understand our relationship with nature and with other living beings on this planet? And how does that then evolve into systemic change? Because we need both. But what is, how would you verbalize and unpack the relationship there across the levels of the system? And it's a really uh, powerful question because um, in fact, bringing one's attention to one's own subjectivity can reinforce our sense of separate self. And that's you know, one of the traps, the shadow pieces in you know, vis-a-vis practice. Um, but also uh, just looking externally, that's also uh, how we've operated. We look out there and we don't understand the relationship. There is no outside and inside per se, it's a continuum. You know, I can say as a, as a Buddhist practitioner, um, the experience of training the mind to actually settle down and uh, not sleep, but awaken, so to speak, um, so that I can see things more clearly. And part of that seeing, um, it, this deep seeing, allows me to see that I, I'm not separate from any being or thing. And also part of that seeing is this constant process of uh, correcting course, because, you know, we all come off the rails all the time. You know, our feet of clay are, you know, they are uh, on uh, all of us. We all have, uh, you know, issues related to the self, the defining and defending of, you know, this separate self, which really is coming out of fear and our, our aversion toward our fear of mortality and finiteness. And I mean, the, the irony is that, uh, well, I, I so appreciate what um, uh, Ty said, you know, a cloud never dies. Um, that, you know, there's no such thing as the end per se. Um, even, you know, our own species, which could come into absolute collapse in relation to what's happening in, in uh, the climate world, which is not separate now from the social world, it actually never has been, but here it's really dramatic, that connection. You understand that we live in a conjury or of a community of uh, not just, you know, human beings, but, you know, of all species. And it's very much uh, what, you know, the work Joanna Macy and her, her vision um, uh, emphasizes. Um, I, I remember uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said, the coming Buddha is the Sangha. Well, it's not just the Sangha of human beings, you know, it's the Sangha of all species. And it's the realization of that. And how does one arrive at that realization, and then from that respond to a world with a sense of, you know, of genuine love and, and care, understanding that we have actually brought upon ourselves this catastrophe, <laughs> it's, that you know, we're not separate from El Nino, we're not separate from the Gulf Stream, we're, we're not separate from each other. And I think practice is a, is a powerful means for exactly that realization through stabilizing our mental continuum, familiarizing ourselves with our you know, own illusions, so to speak, not being a toy of them, but recognizing the biases and the illusions that give us this sense of a separate self. And then to come into a place, you know, it's, a, it's in a way choiceless awareness, you know, where we are, we are just in this moment as it is interconnected without any sense of self and other. And uh, I think this is really um, 
you know, the work that practitioners, you know, have been engaged in for thousands of years, some more successfully than others. Um, but I mentioned another path. You know, there is the path of practice, which is a rather, um, uh, in most cases, um, a, a slow deconstructing of the separate self. But there's another process that I think we're in, and I, I, it's crisis. It's like a kind of global shamanic crisis that we're in, having a kind of breakdown of multiple systems. And from the point of view of complex adaptive systems, it's kind of important to understand that systems that break down and learn from the breakdown process reorganize themselves often at a more robust level. And that's what, you know, I looked at the pandemic in a certain way. It was a systemic breakdown, you know, of our medical system, our social system, of our psychological system, our physical system. We learned some really important things, including, you know, the brokenness of our medical system, for example. So, you know, my, my deep sort of uh, broken-hearted hope <laughs> if you will, is for us to, as you, you know, so uh, powerfully did in the beginning of our conversation, which is to touch deeply into the grief, to recognize um, how uh, the role of fear, um, to recognize how our clinging creates more suffering for ourselves and others. And then, you know, out of that sort of crisis, um, not to commit suicide, which is rampant. You know, in Japan, for example, in Korea, in this country among young people, what wants to die is the sense of a separate self. It's like misplaced concreteness. And what wants to awaken is this, you know, the, the Sangha or the community of all species as Buddha, as, you know, as our fundamental awakening. <laughs> 